Hey, how's it going? Hey, good. How are you? Oh, doing so good. So glad you're here. Everybody say <laughs> hi, Suze. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> We're so stoked to have you. Cool. I am going to try to make this full screen. Actually, this is fine. Cool. Awesome. Well, take it away. Awesome. Uh, how's everyone doing tonight? Awesome. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I am coming to you live from New York in my uh, very tiny Brooklyn study. So you're in my lair tonight. Ha ha ha. Uh, but you'll be safe, I promise. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, but I just wanted to say hi to everybody before I actually do that. Um, and then yeah, hopefully you'll see a little bit more of me later on in the presentation. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let me know if you can see this, if everyone can just raise their hands. Awesome, okay, perfect. All right, let's do this. So I won't be able to see you for the rest, but shout out if uh, there's anything actually wrong and I can try and fix that. So, cool. Uh, so if you can't see that, just start yelling at me and then I'll, I'll do the rest, uh, I'll figure it out. So, cool. So thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm very, very excited to be part of, uh, of um, PDX Node. I've actually wanted to come out and be there in person for a long time now, so maybe soon. Uh, but I really appreciate you all having me uh, remotely. So thanks, Ben, and the organizers for having me. So I'm going to be talking about Yay! <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about machine learning tonight. I'm going to be trying to unpack some of the hype. Um, and for those who haven't really looked at what machine learning is and how it works, I'll explain a little bit of that. But I'll also explain how to use machine learning even if you don't have lots of math skills or even if you don't really know how to create your own neural network. I'll definitely show you some really cool APIs that you can use already that where all the hard work's been done for you. So thanks again for joining me. So uh, for those who um, haven't seen one of my talks before, I'm Suze. Uh, I do write code at Microsoft. Um, I work mostly in dev relations slash dev advocacy um, sort of position. So I work with a lot of um, external companies to help them onboard onto our tools and our cloud services. Uh, although like my personal passions are JavaScript, accessibility, robots and machine learning. Um, so yeah, the last one is what I'm talking about tonight. And if you'd like to follow me on either GitHub, uh, Twitter, or Twitch, uh, you can find me as NoUpCat, but you can also call me NoopCat. Um, it doesn't really matter what the pronunciation is. Cool. So. I'm here at the beginning of this talk to tell you what is machine learning, but I think what's been helpful for me in the past uh, when thinking about this question is actually to identify what isn't machine learning first. Um, that kind of helps you rule out a bunch of things so that you don't sort of get confused between like what's data science or, or what, what are algorithms and what are actual machine learning. Um, so I like to start with this example. Um, I don't know whether anyone saw this tech inside a video where it was a bunch of drones flying around and uh, the caption says they used coding and algorithms so the drones didn't crash into each other. So is this machine learning? Um, probably not. And the, the joke online that I saw that accompanied this screenshot was this here. <laughs> um, so if you see a code like this, such as if going to crash into each other, don't. That's definitely not machine learning. You know, that's that's still humans programming a machine in, with very explicit instructions. So that's sort of a funny example of something that I would definitely not classify as machine learning. Um, other examples of things that aren't machine learning are things like um, just regular data science. Um, where you are actually writing the either the conditionals, the if and else's, or you're actually applying something that you've learned through theory or math or statistical um, formulas in order to kind of uh, get an outcome out of it. So that's definitely not it either. Um, but what actually is machine learning then? So I like to think of the first example we just talked about, what isn't machine learning as, uh, you have an input, you give that to the computer um, or you give that to your software and you say, here's how I want you to solve this problem in order to give me the output that I desire, right? And so that's the not machine learning part of it. Um, whereas what I think of as machine learning is you give the computer an input and um, you tell it that you want, you tell it kind of what output you want, 
But the bit in between, the bit in the middle is just go figure it out yourself. Um, and, and, you know, like you can give it the structure in order to do that, but you're not explicitly telling it exactly how to do that. Um, it's not explicit lines of code. So, so yeah, um, so that's been helpful for me to be able to examine different um, examples of what looks like highly uh, complex, you know, computation and try and figure out whether or not it's actually machine learning. So uh, what are some common uses for machine learning? Um, a lot of you have probably seen um, different really cool applications of it uh, in the major media, but um, you can break it down to very kind of data science-y um, terms, such as uh, it's very useful for things like regression, which checks for whether or not um, a certain factor had an impact on like some resulting data or a resulting scenario. You can have prediction, um, such as, you know, if you want to attempt to predict um, the, you know, the changes and um, outcomes of the stock market, then you could certainly use machine learning to try to do that. Um, you can use it for classification. So, you, you know, for example, you can supply it with an image and say, well, is this a dog or is it a cat or is there none of them in this picture? So that's explicitly what the classification would be. Uh, clustering is sort of feels like classification, but it's a little bit different. Um, clustering is when you put a, uh, a ton of data into um, a machine learning algorithm and it sort of tries to group things. And the groupings might seem super abstract, but the idea is that um, humans looking at this data alone uh, with like, you know, human biases will a lot of the time not really be able to discern like what what the relationships between certain um, pieces of data can be. And so you can have this thing called clustering, which you can even do with things like images, where it tries to um, it tries to figure out whether there's relationships between different points of data, and then it shows that. Um, so if you've ever seen like a, a T-SNE animation, which is like a very um, impressive looking animation where um, you just see all these points in space and all of a sudden they just start grouping together, you might have seen some of those animations used in machine learning videos to look all impressive. Um, that's what's called clustering. Uh, the last one, um, but there's, there's other applications too, but the last one is something like anomaly detection. So, um, you know, you can put a lot of data through, but you can actually look to see if anything is actually standing out um, and doesn't fit in. So that's pretty cool too. All right, but how does machine learning actually work, right? Like, <laughs> it, it seems like it's this impenetrable black box, um, but... The, the fact is that humans still set up, you know, neural networks and, and, and other machine learning um, algorithms. And so it is still, we're still able to learn about it. And if you've ever been scared off by the idea of having to learn math or having to learn complex um, programming, I'm sort of here tonight to hopefully make you feel more comfortable with the idea of digging deeper. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a very oversimplified crash course tonight. Um, it's gonna be like a teaser um, because I want you to feel the confidence and the curious to go and explore that later on. Okay, so let's look at probably one of the most popular types of machine learning, which is neural networks. It's like the buzzword in the media and everyone's talking about it. And it has blown up recently because we finally have the computational power um, and we finally have cloud services such as um, AWS and Azure um, in order to spin up like really high um high performance GPUs to, to crunch this data, this data. So that's why neural networks have blown up recently, but also because they're fascinating and they solve problems that we never thought computers could solve. So in a neural network, um, you, you basically have these entities that it's made up of called perceptrons. Now, perceptrons um, are kind of likened to uh, neurons in your brain where, you know, they fire, but they also take input, right, from, from a vast network of other neurons that it's connected to. So you can think of perceptrons as that. And so let's say we have two points of data that we want to feed into our uh, neural network in order to uh, provide an answer at the end, which could be something like a classification, for example. Um, then we can take those two inputs and let's say, you know, one value is five and the other one is six. We tend to work with really small, um, we tend to work with really small values in our machine learning. We're going to take those two values and we're actually going to apply a weight 
to each of them. So these weights could be something like uh, 0.6 or 1.25 or something like that. Um, one approach when you're starting out with neural networks is to just assign random weights when you first set that neural network up um, because machine learning is all about like the machine guessing at first, getting it wrong, and then continually starting to improve. So starting with random weights is, is sometimes considered okay, um, but there are definitely lots of theories on how you pick them in the first place. Uh, once those um, inputs have had those weights applied, um, it comes into like the actual perceptron. And what that does is it um, computes like a threshold amount, right? And so that's the start of the value that it's going to pass on to the next perceptron. Um, and it, it's it's basically like whether it's going to fire or not. So, you know, whether it's um, whether it's actually a zero or one. So um, in order for us to compute that threshold, um, the math isn't actually too bad at this point. <laughs> so we take input one, we times that by weight one, then we take input two and we times that by weight two, and then we add them together. Um, now, some um, some kind of more complex algorithms will use something like a bias to add at the end. Um, I, I'm trying to remember what that's used for, um, so I won't actually speculate. <laughs> um, but sometimes it can correct things like I think if you if you keep ending up with zeros and things like that, it can actually the bias can actually help to provide like some some values to actually play with. Uh, once we actually have that threshold, um, it's put through what's called an activation function uh, before it's passed on to the next perceptron. Um, so that's called a sigmoid function. And what it essentially does is it takes kind of like, it takes a zero or a one or a hard kind of threshold, and it actually just smooths that out slightly. Um, and that sort of makes it, again, if we look, if we think about our neuron in our brain, it kind of uh, makes it it doesn't make it so on and off E, I guess that's a really unscientific term, but it smooths the result and that in the end, the desired effect is, so when we're training this algorithm, we can actually, um, the machine can understand whether or not it's slowly improving or whether it's actually getting worse or not, right? So that it's not just like um, you're right or you're wrong, if that makes sense, or you should not have fired or maybe you should have fired. Um, so that's how that works. And then um, when it comes out of that sigmoid function, you have the output and then that output um, can either be fed into another perceptron or maybe it's actually the final output. So I hope that all makes sense so far. Um, and so once you put all of these together, so in this case, we have three inputs. Uh, we have these um, perceptrons in the middle that's uh, part of what's called a hidden layer. Um, and the hidden layer, really all that means is it's a bit of a deceiving term, but it means um, the perceptrons in the middle that aren't either part of the input group and are not part of the output group. So if you want to think about it, we can observe the input and the output, right? But we won't necessarily be observing these hidden layers in between. So I guess that's how I remember like that they're hidden layers. It's it's usually the things that you're letting the actual um, neural network do its work there and you tend to not be influencing that, right? Um, but you will be influencing the input and you will actually be observing the output. And so in order to train these uh, neural networks, in order to do work, uh, you provide the inputs for whatever you're trying to compute. So for example, we could be looking at color contrast and what color text is best on what color background, for example. So let's say these inputs are R, G, and B, um, and they're just values. Um, we, what we can do is we can feed those values in and we, uh, when we train these neural networks, instead of just getting it to figure out the answer and leaving it at that, we actually include the, um, the correct answer um, to the training data, right? And so when it goes through, um, when we run a training function on this, uh, the additional thing it does at the end is it actually checks its work. So um, when you pass one set of training data through, it will look at every single output and say, okay, was this correct? And if it wasn't correct, um, what it does, and I'll, I'll explain this really quickly because I don't have a lot of time to go into detail, um, but it can take that error rate and it can do what's called backwards propagation back through those hidden um, those hidden layers, and it can slowly adjust those weights that we talked about at the beginning, right? So if you assign them randomly, 
and you put that um, those inputs through, it's going to be basically a random guess at the beginning when you uh, when you train it for the first time. But as it sees its error rates and it backwards propagates and adjusts those weights, um, and it will it will take that error rate and distribute the adjustment depending on the value of the weight. So things that have a high weight are, tend to be blamed the most um, for having the wrong answer, if that makes sense. Um, so. Hopefully that kind of made sense as to how it's get, it gets trained. Once it's trained, um, it's it's thought of to have like the optimal weights for every single um, you know connection that's happening in this neural network. And then what happens is you can actually pass through normal data um, that doesn't have the answer to it, and that's where you're supposed to have a fully working neural network. So that, in a nutshell, is how they work. But you might have heard about this thing called a convolutional neural net, which sounds super complicated. Um, and it is actually more complicated than a regular neural network that you've seen. But this is the one that is particularly good at analyzing images, which I'm going to go into a couple of examples um, afterwards. But it's it's very, very effective on visual material. And um, I'll show you in a few examples so you can see why. Um, so. Let's say you've got this picture of a corgi, and other than the fact that corgis are adorable, <laughs> um, you know, we, we also want to say, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm doing a thing where I'm trying to create a Twitter bot, and it only tweets pictures of corgis. So if people tweet me a picture of a corgi, I'll like, I'll actually retweet that. But if they don't, then I'm not going to do anything. So that's a very simple example of that. Um, how do you pass a corgi picture, though, into a neural network? Well, kind of like how we had the RGB colors before, um, you, you can kind of think about this and it's a little bit staggering, but you think of every single picture, uh, sorry, pixel uh, in this picture is an input. And so that could be a value um, that designates its color or even its shade, um, you know, in grayscale. And that's actually how it works, which is kind of mind blowing because that's a lot of data points. And so I really like this diagram by um, the Berkeley ML Lab or like machine learning lab blog. Um, essentially, every single picture of the image, as I said before, is um, in on the left side in blue, if you can see the blue. Um, and so each layer is kind of responsible for determining different things. And we have these convolutional uh, layers and we have these pooling layers, which I'll touch on briefly soon. But so let's say the first layer is kind of just looking for more abstract things. So that hidden layer is looking for patches of lines. Are they ovals? Are they triangles? And you can think of patches of lines as maybe that could mean this fur. You can think of ovals as pretty abstract, but maybe it's, it's talking about whether or not, um, you know, something is is an eye um, or there's a pair of eyes. Of course, that differs if the dog is uh, photographed on the side in a profile, but that's sort of a very general example here. <laughs> and then also, are there triangles? That could say that there are ears or there are a nose, right? And you can kind of see ovals or triangles could be a nose. And so, you know, it kind of gets complex, um, but this is where we trust the machine to adjust the weights correctly until we get the desired result, right? And so in the end, when we have the, the fully connected, uh, you know, convolutional layer, it comes out as, well, is it a dog? And you're going to get a confidence level. And so for a dog, um, you know, you would get between zero and one is your confidence level. So it's very similar to um, things like prediction and uh, data science statistics and things like that. Um, so, you know, people have different thresholds for what they, they accept as, as confident. Um, so for example, you could say, eh, if the value is 0 0.6 or above confidence, it's a dog, then I'll accept that. <laughs> so it's also about like, what confidence are you comfortable with? Um, and you can totally like, you can totally manipulate that um, even when you're using machine learning APIs, which is pretty cool. All right, and then just to give you a really quick example of what these neural, um, these convolutional neural networks are doing, they're kind of alternating between pooling and convolution layers. So think of convolution layers as like it's taking individual kind of tiles of an image 
Um, and it's trying to pick out like features. So it could be looking for edges. Um, it could be looking for combinations of edges and things like that. And then you're pulling layers. Um, you can think of as like down sampling layers. So they're trying to take kind of the largest feature it can see in the, the convolution tile in the previous layer. And it's trying to downsample just to get the most important detail. And then it kind of alternates between pulling and convolution until you have things like you can take edges and you can um, find eyes or you know the profile of noses. And then that can build up to be a face. So um, you know different layers are responsible for doing different things, um, which is kind of cool. So uh, one of the most common data um, data training sort of hello worlds of the machine learning world is like um, being able to recognize uh, written handwritten numerals. So things like um, if you take a picture of a check in your banking app, you know, it's using this kind of OCR, this, um, you know, optic character recognition software. And this has been around for a really long time. And this is actually how it works. Um, so if you've got your first input layer, which is the number eight, you can kind of see the convolutional layer, um, you know, is the result of you know, adding the pixels together with all these different weights and different combinations of the pixels. Then you have your pulling layer, which you can see is trying to get detail. And then each convolutional and pulling layer from there is, is picking up different tiles and then reducing that down. Then we have the, um, the fully connected layer one and fully connected layer two, a kind of like a one-to-one -one where we're trying to map that data to very specific um, neurons so that you can have a one-to-one -one relationship. From there, at the very top, it's so hard to see because this drawing was really small, um, but you basically have a, a bunch of pixels there, which is like from, you know, zero to nine. And essentially, the um, you end up with nine different outputs in an algorithm uh, in a neural network like this, where you have different confidences for each number. And generally what returns the highest confidence is the number that the machine has best guessed it is based on like, you know, how well trained it is. So yes, yeah, so that was a lot to handle, but that's sort of the, the beginnings of what you should be looking into if you're interested in finding out more about this stuff. And I have a really great book recommendation for you. It is, um, it is coming from a Python computer language angle because Python has some amazing math libraries and data science libraries to use. So I definitely highly encourage checking out Make Your Own Neural Network. Um, this is the book that I started with, and I just love even the blurb, which is a gentle journey through the mathematics of neural networks. And you do actually end up creating your own um, uh, character recognition um, neural network, which uh, uses the MNIST um, numeral set. So there are already corpuses out there um, and sample data out there that you can use to train your neural network with, which is amazing. And I felt that I'd be letting you all down if I didn't find you a JavaScript one too. So um, this is written by um, Hatha. She's she's an amazing software engineer, um, but it's now being taken on by the general community because it's unmaintained. Um, so it's called BrainJS, and you can go to brainjs.com to see a color contrast uh, implementation of a neural network. And it's really cool because you end up training the um, you end up training them. Uh, the neural network with your own perception of color. And then at the end, you can view the results. So I highly recommend you check out brainjs.com. Uh, it's a super cool example. But here's the thing, like I'm a really lazy programmer and it's not necessarily my job to work on machine learning all day. So it can be kind of hard to end up like, you know, spinning up GPUs, which can cost a lot of money and um, just trying to implement these things myself. And so, you know, I'm, I've am i been a front-end developer for a while now, and usually I'm just like, well, can I have an API? That would be cool. Can I just have a, is it a corgi.com slash decide, you know, API? That would be really great. Um, and the good news is that there's totally APIs out there and they're made by lots of different companies as well. And so you can definitely look at which ones are going to be right for you. So I've been using a bunch of these over the last six months. Um, these particular ones here are um, released by Microsoft. And so I'm the most familiar with these. Um, so there is a translator API that I've been playing with. There's a computer vision service, uh, which is incredible incredible because it, you can upload a picture and it'll literally come back with a brown cow standing in a lush green field staring straight on at the camera, uh, which is amazing to me. 
<laughs> um, and so it's kind of freaky because you'll you'll throw a weird image up and, and you'll be gobsmacked at the accuracy that it comes back with. Uh, there's also the custom vision service, which allows you to actually train your own visual model. So it has categories such as text and food and things like that. And so if you want a model that can tell you whether it's a cheese pizza or a pepperoni pizza, you could literally create that in the custom vision service with the drag and drop you know, um, set of images, and then you can just tag them all with pepperoni or not pepperoni. Um, and so I attempted to use that recently, and I'm going to show you the results of that in a sec. There's also the custom speech service, which I love because uh, I'm from Australia, and I've been living in the US for a few years, and I have a really funny accent. So I'm going to talk about my experiments with that later on as well. <laughs> Um, but here's the thing, like if I'm using these APIs, then I don't really get a choice, um, you know, around like what the results are. Like, am I just stuck with the default models? Well, as I showed you before, there are some such as computer vision service and translator API that have their own base model and it's unchangeable. However, if you see um, any kind of machine learning API that says custom in the front of it, then generally you can create your own model, which is like really cool because you're not stuck with like, um, something that might not quite fit what your needs are. So I'm going to talk, um, before my time's up, I'm going to talk to you about what it's like to train models and the different ways that um, that different services allow you to train models, which is pretty cool. Um, so I don't know if anyone knows my friend Wilman, uh, Wilman Duffy. <laughs> um, he helps organize Brooklyn JS over in New York City. Um, you know, so that's like a, a sister meetup to Node PDX, I guess you could say. And... I heard a little woo. That's great. Thank you. Um, and so I, I wanted to create a silly website that basically was able to identify whether or not someone was Wilman. So it was like a very simple instruction for the um, for the neural network. But I thought I would give that a go. So I think I might have to exit this presentation. I'm I'm usually used to presenter mode. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So uh, one sec. Can you raise your hands if you can see the browser? Okay, sweet. All right, thanks. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. So um, this is a very silly website that I've got hosted on Glitch. Um, so you can check the code out later. I'm going to have to delete my API keys out of it because otherwise you're going to be able to use them. Um, but um, for now, you, you know, I'm using this live on Glitch. So I'm, I'm hoping that people can have a look at this later to see how I did it. Um, but I'm going to take a photo of myself and I'm going to see if it thinks I'm Wilman. Now I'll show you Wilman in a sec, but um, he wears glasses a lot of the time and he has short hair like me. So I was a little bit nervous. So I'm just going to like look straight at the camera and take a shot. Okay. Then I'm going to click identify and we're going to see. Oh, well, there you go. I don't think it's Wellman. So that's pretty cool. That worked. Um, but you're probably thinking that I'm cheating and like, you know, it's just everything that you click is not Wellman. Um, well, I trained a model with pictures of Wellman, but then um, after I trained it, I needed fresh data. So I asked Wellman to send me a bunch of um, a bunch of selfies that he's never published to the internet. So no Snapchat, no Instagram, no Twitter. Um, and so usually I can have him here with me and he can like come on in, but he wasn't able to make it tonight. So I did something silly and I printed out a photo of him. Um, so we'll see if this actually works, but I'm gonna hold up. This is Wilman Duffy. So yeah, say hi. He's very pleased to see you, he's on the, he's on the train. Looks like he might be on the M actually. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna try and take a photo of this while I can't really see. Okay, so let's see if it thinks this is Wilman. This is very silly. Ah, it, it actually didn't work. Okay, so what have we learned here? Facial recognition is not in is not an effective way of um, authorization or passwords or any kind of security. Okay, so if somebody at work says to you, "Hey, we should totally do facial recognition for logging in," yeah, just show them this <laughs> because it totally works. So that's that's uh, that's probably not secure. Cool. Um, so again, you can see that on Glitch. It's is it um, and you can check that out. And please don't abuse my uh, API keys. I will remove them later on after this presentation. But yeah, so that's a quick demo of how you can train your own model to recognize very specific people, um, which is kind of creepy, but kind of cool. Um, and Wilman did actually give me permission before I stalked his Facebook for all of his selfies. Um, so thank you very much, Wilman. And, and also, 
that picture was had never been published on the internet, but I understand that this is recorded. So sorry, woman, that one's actually published now. <laughs> okay. So the thing that I learned about this really quick project that I put together was to choose the right model. So the first thing I actually started with um, was the custom vision service model. And so here you can see, um, I, I stalked his Facebook, I close cropped some of the pictures and I uploaded just like lots of varieties of lighting and um, expressions and glasses and not glasses. And so <laughs> I ended up with 61 images, which is almost embarrassing. Um, and I thought, okay, it's totally gonna get this. I uploaded about 70 pictures of just random people and their random faces so that it could understand that there's like a correlation between the photos of Wilman and the photos of not Wilman. The unfortunate thing is when I went to test it, I tested it with myself in my study, as you can see, and uh, I don't know if you can see the results there, but there's a 99.1% probability that that's Wilman. <laughs> um, and so that didn't really work. Um, and I was not very impressed to be confused with my friend because, um, yeah, <laughs> um, I think that that that's not really cool. Um, anyway, um, so what I learned was that you should really, instead of using a generic model, so uh, you can choose some food and text and stuff, but it the, the custom vision service doesn't have one for people specifically. Um, and so um, I just chose the general one and unfortunately that was too general, right? So definitely look for um, a either a neural network that or like a, a model you can train that's already tuned to faces, right? Um, and so that for me is actually the Microsoft Face API. Um, I ended up using the same photos to train the Face API instead, and then I was able to do the facial recognition through that. So that was much more helpful. So when you're thinking about stuff, it does actually matter which service you choose and also which like um, neural network um, you're working with and what its base model is actually supposed to be good at, because different things are good at other things based on all of those weights that we talked about. But what about speech? So this is very close to my heart. Um, I'm a huge um, advocate for accessibility. Um, and so every video that I upload on YouTube, even ones where I'm talking about oatmeal, um, I actually pay for them um, to, to be captioned. So I get these subtitle files that have like the timestamps and then what I said. Um, and the, they are actually, um, they do, they are standard, so there's different subtitle standard files. So they're actually very reliable files when you upload them to YouTube and that kind of thing. Um, so I use rev.com, I love them, they're a dollar a minute. And so um, I'm able to afford to do my YouTube videos, um, but I stream on Twitch every single weekend and I do live coding. Um, so shout out to anyone who, who might have seen them. Um, but I, I stream for two and a half hours at a time and I'm talking constantly in them. And so um, it, it gets very expensive for me to, Trans, uh, to get every single one transcribed. And so my dream is for machine learning to be good enough to be able to live translate me um, or like live caption me and have it be super accurate, like, you know, human accuracy or better, um, because that would just open up my stream for a much wider audience. And I would just absolutely love to have more participation and access. Um, so a project of mine is to uh, explore two different APIs right now. I'm using the Microsoft Translator API, which is incredible. And it's actually coming to PowerPoint soon. So you're going to be able to tra live translate uh, your presentation into several languages, which is amazing. Uh, but also custom speech service is something that um, I'm going to need, and that's because I have a weird accent. Um, and so I wrote some Node.js stuff for you to use if you want to use these really cool like speech-based APIs because um, we don't always have Node.js SDKs for this stuff. And so um, part of my job is to sort of look at what we need and fill that in um, for people to use. So the first uh, library that I released really recently, it's so recent, it doesn't quite have tests yet, but they're coming, um, is the uh, unofficial like Microsoft Translator speech to text service. Um, and so this makes it really easy for you to supply either a stream of audio so if you're talking live, or you can give it static audio files that are already on the disk. Um, and this is all the code that it requires. And so you require it, uh, you give it your subscription key, you tell it the to language, you tell it what language you want to be from. And so here, I want it to understand me in English and then just give me the English output. So that's why it's EN. 
And then once you've um, created a new service, you can start it, uh, listen for messages, which are actually the translation objects that come back through the, the pipe. This is actually using web sockets underneath. Uh, and then if you want to do a static file, that's the easiest thing ever. Um, I created a method called service.send file, and that's it. You listen for the translation that come back through the, uh, the web socket pipe. So that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing that I've kind of been really into is just how to automate um, training data sets better, right? And so with the custom speech API, you need to have the training data in a very specific format. So you need to have passages of like spoken content, you know, so like audio, and it usually has to be around a sentence long. Um, and then you have to have each sentence in a separate audio file. And then you point the, the physically written transcription. Um, you also have like a list of those and you match each uh, transcription to the file name by putting them on the same line. Um, and I, I do have an example um, in this library, so you can look at that later on. And so what I ended up doing was I thought, well, I have these subtitle files from the uh, YouTube videos, and they're very accurate timestamps. And then I have these YouTube videos and these Twitch videos of me talking. And so what would happen if I went through the timestamps and I, I actually um, sliced up the large audio file into really small sentence utterances that I'm doing. And then I can actually use those um, subtitle files to uh, place the, the actual sentences in, in text of what I said in order to prepare that data set for training. And so I made this library um, called the Acoustic Model Machine. And it takes an audio WAV file, it takes a matching subtitle file, and it actually just snips out all of those separate sentences I've said. Um, it will save all of those files in an audio directory, which you can zip up and um, upload to the custom speech service. And then it gives you your transcription file, which is just line by line, uh, the file name, and then what I said. And then the next line is the next file name, and then what I said next. And so it's actually pretty cool. It worked really well. Um, and I wanted to open sources to share with everyone. So I ended up making it a command line tool because I felt like this was too good to share to myself because it was so fast for me to generate an entire data set just by paying a dollar an hour for some for some transcriptions. And so I'm not sure whether you can see that number there, but I ended up getting it to be uh, at a 12.58% error rate, and that's actually pretty low. Um, so I've got it to 88% accuracy so far, and that's only training it on 22 minutes of my voice. So imagine if I train this on several hours of my voice, I just need to dig out all of my subtitles and my videos off YouTube. I really think that I could train this really well. Um, and so uh, this is my acoustic model in the custom speech service. And then at the bottom, it's showing those transcriptions. And then once you've trained it, it actually uh, puts all of the audio back into the system again to see how accurate it was at uh, matching what, what it was actually trained with, which is really cool. Um, so you can see that it's actually pretty accurate just by those two transcriptions that you're seeing. So before I finish up, I wanted to just on a serious note say that Machine learning is an incredible thing that's going to enrich a lot of lives. It's going to make things a lot easier for us, and it's going to help with things like accessibility, um, and it's going to help make short work of things that are normally super laborious for humans. However, we are in charge of that as engineers. We don't need licenses to write machine learning um, code, and we have a lot of power. And I'm not going to use a Spider-Man quote, but you know what I'm getting at. You know, if you uh, creating your own training data sets, be really careful about the bias that you might have produced um, and, and put into those data sets. You know, we're all human, we're all capable of bias. Um, and so be careful that your data set, for example, isn't racist or sexist or like, you know, um, something that can cause a lot of harm to others. And we've all seen like things blow up in the media where things have just gone super wrong. So definitely learn from those examples. Don't create data sets on your own. Show them to others. Ask, the, ask other people who are different to you and just, just keep that in mind because um, we have all of these publicly available APIs and they're incredible, but let's not ruin it for each other. And like, yeah, let's just sort of stop and think sometimes. So that's the teacher lecture over. I'm very sorry, but I think it's very important to say. So if you want to learn more, I'm going to show you some of my uh, favorite resources. So Rachel Thomas is incredible. Um, she's a lecturer. She's like incredibly um, experienced at this stuff. She's an expert. She does really amazing um, 
two hour long lectures sometimes even, uh, YouTube videos that she records um, of her lectures. And I've learned a lot through um, her videos. Gene Kogan is an incredible guy that's doing really cool things with things like style transfer, which is another cool thing, and Deep Dream. Um, and he has a website called Machine Learning for Artists, and it's a continually building resource for those who want to learn machine learning as artists to do cool, creative things with, but they might be scared about you know it being too hard to learn. So I think he's very accessible. Daniel Schiffman is another incredibly accessible um, uh teacher he has a youtube channel called coding rain uh coding train sorry coding train uh and it's incredible um and he's got a neural network um sort of like series that he's starting to build up. Um, he injured himself recently, so he's recovering, but I think he's gonna add to that series really soon. So definitely check him out because he's really funny and he's really smart. And if you were excited by the idea of using, you know, like um, pre-trained models or um, even just base models that you can train further, um, the example that I showed you with Wilman and that acoustic model data set stuff that I showed you is all from the Microsoft Cognitive Services. And um, we really believe in democratizing machine learning for everybody. Um, and so our stuff is super affordable to get started with. Um, and I highly encourage you to sign up for a, uh, for an access key and just start making those calls and see what you come up with. So I'm excited to hear from you if you end up doing anything or learning more. I hope these uh, resources were helpful and that I left them up on the screen long enough for you to take uh, a photo. And yeah, I think I'm over time. So I just um, wanted to say thank you so much for having me and I hope that this was helpful. I think I'm back. You are? Yes, I'm back. back. Hi. <laughs> that was super, super Hi. great. Um, I'm going Thank to give you. the room, uh, leave the room open for questions for a moment, if that's all right with you. Yeah, I can take questions. OK, cool. Anybody have a question? Oh, we got one over there. All right. Can I use this to trade my or train my day trading uh, Bitcoin bot? Are people doing machine learning for that? Did you say a Bitcoin bot? Yeah, like an auto trading bot on GDAX or something like that, you know, where it just like tries to buy low and sell high. That sounds super cool. It's not something that I've looked into, but I'm sure that there's something you can do with that. I think that that's actually really creative. I never would have thought of that. That's great. <laughs> um, any other questions? Okay, a couple back there. Hold on. Run in with the mic. Here we go. Hi, uh, quick question about the transcript uh, API. Does it provide a timestamp of uh, words? So, or it's just like a, a big chunk of text or it can let you know the, the time, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Is this for the translation API you said? No, the transcript, transcripting some audio. So, uh, oh, okay, text. yeah. So um, the subtitle files I had were actually done by humans, and they have the timestamps in them, and that's how I was able to calculate where to pull them out. Um, but for the translation API, you can actually turn timestamps on, and it will tell you that live as the messages are coming in. It gives you a time offset for when that happens. So yeah, so technically you could pull that down and generate your own subtitle files with it because you do get the timing with that data. Hope right. that made sense and that answered your question. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Uh, just wondering if you've ever thought about the verify if you're human checkboxes that are at like the bottom of login screens to prevent like uh, somebody from automating attacks. Uh, what sort of role, those do seem to be like some sort of machine learning thing happening in the background. What sort of role are we playing by clicking on the boxes to check, like, is this a sign? Is this a boat? Is this a car? Uh, can you speak to that at all? Have you thought about that? Yeah, definitely. Are you asking about, like, what is our role in actually continually, like, breaking those things and then making the algorithm better? Is that sort of what you mean? or uh, more, more along the lines that, like, what sort of are we training or are we verifying? Do you, could any idea, like, are we training the, uh, the machine and, and saying, well, this is a sign, look for things that look like this, or are we actually verifying, or maybe we're doing both? Uh, I don't know if you can speak to that at all. So I don't know the answer to that, but I have the feeling it might actually be both. Um, if you remember the recaptures, 
where you know one of them you type in as verification and one of them is actually like further training the OCR algorithm. I think that um, that kind of thing is probably happening um, whenever you use those kind of services that prove you're human. Because if they're able to later on actually prove that and verify it, then you're actually just, yeah, you're feeding back into the cycle. And I would say that that's probably happening for a lot of the services that you use, that, that use that machine learning. It will use you to strengthen itself, which is sort of creepy to think about. I hope, they, I hope that answered your question. I'm so sorry if it didn't. Hi, sorry. I'll keep this quick. This is great. For the deaf community, something like this is fantastic. Is there any process or application of reversing the process so that those who are partially deaf and maybe not profoundly deaf that still have oral capabilities can, or uh, that can still speak can use this to actually for voice to text also to communicate two ways? Yeah, so most of the time that um, that doesn't involve like literally reversing the same algorithm that can detect like um, text, you know, from the speech. But there are actually um, text to speech APIs that you can use. Um, and so the, the cool thing actually about the translation API is I didn't mention this, but you can put an extra parameter on the end of your of your like endpoint connection. And you can actually ask for the speech back in a different language, um, which is kind of fascinating. So you can have it, you can talk at it in English, and then you can get something back in like French for example, um, and it will send you the binary data of the audio um, that you can then play back again. So it's this is huge for accessibility, and yeah, it's it's huge for um, just in just communication in general, right? It's it's pretty cool. You mentioned some APIs that we could find. Where would where would we find something like that? I'm so sorry. Could you mention? That? Could you say that again? I didn't catch it. You mentioned there were some APIs that were available for that. Where would where would we find that? Where would I find that? There are some APIs available for the text to speech. I think I misunderstood. I think I misunderstood what you said. I sorry. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh no, 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 that's okay. Yeah. So, um, so if if you if you have any questions about um, these services that are available, definitely hit me up on Twitter. But also, um, that last link in my resources. If you Google like Microsoft Cognitive Services, you can pretty much tear that entire offering apart. There's just dozens of different services. Um, so if you don't find something that you need, let me know because there can be some nuanced areas of some APIs that will actually give you what you want. It's just not obvious up front. So yeah, definitely connect with me because I feel like that will be probably a bit more productive. Whoop, whoop. Oh yeah, one more question. Hey there. Um, years ago I was working with some AI type packages. Uh, running data sets was usually pretty compute intensive. Are you just running that off like a server desktop or are you actually pushing it up into the cloud? Are you asking when you're training something with like big data sets, like what kind of architecture to use? Is yeah, that what you're asking? Yeah, some of the development that you're doing right now, it looks like it was a small data set you can do off a desktop. Uh, but is that a misnomer nowadays? Because I'm assuming compute power has gotten to be pretty cheap and the algorithms have gotten pretty uh, efficient nowadays. Yeah, totally. So, so for example, the 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 um, the neural network that you can code in that Python book, um, you can totally do on your own desktop machine. Um, you know, and it, it it doesn't actually take that long. So, for pretty simple stuff, you can absolutely use just like a standard computer. Um, when you want to um, crunch a lot of stuff. Um, you know, it's kind of similar to Bitcoin mining. You um, you create some GPU instances, so you either use the GPUs in AWS or you can use um, the GPU VMs in Azure, and they're pretty cheap. Um, like the Azure ones um, start at less than two dollars an hour. So if you're spending like three hours training something, then that's pretty affordable. Um, so yeah, it depends on your the size of your data set, but it is really super affordable to spin something up and then spin it down and like not actually be paying the money for these giant machines unless you actually need them. So yeah, you're totally right. And I hope that kind of addressed what you were saying. Any more questions? All right. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was super fun. And yeah, please have a really good night. And thanks again for having me. Yeah, you're awesome, Suze. Thanks again. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.